Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with... It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here for checking out the series. Hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with all the interviews that we put out every single week. It's a new one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Three a week. So it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. And I'm so excited to be talking with them today. Black Francis, Charles Thompson, Pixies, back with a brand new record called The Night the Zombies Came. Hello, my friend. Nice to see you again. You guys got this fantastic new record, though, with the uh, the night the zombies came, which I don't know. You've been on a roll. Uh, just I don't know if you call it banging them out lately, but <laughs> it it feels like you're kind of I don't know. What What is this? You know, you you have consistently released great music throughout your career. But is there something that you feel like has been different these past few years? I guess the one thing that's different now is that. Because of the advent of uh, streaming music, and uh, streaming music has made it so to, I don't know if it's the sole reason why, but um, I guess you could say the, the, the advent of the internet and then streaming has kind of turned the record business upside down and what has happened as a result of that is that everyone says it's so different now but i would disagree and just say no just the mountains and the valleys have kind of shifted their position you know what i mean and so what has happened is it's made the the live uh it's made a personal appearances right have a certain kind of value that I think they didn't, there wasn't as much value on concerts before. I mean, they were very valuable, but what was also just as valuable was the, the recorded music reference, right? The records that people put out. And so people spent money on records and then they also spent money on concert tickets. But now what has happened is that People spend way less money on on records and they still spend the same or more amount of money on the personal appearances. And so as a result of that paradigm, if you're established and you have a reputation and you have a name, the audience is much more willing to go and see, say, me versus someone who's brand new, right? Because they go, okay, I know what I'm getting involved in here, especially for so-called legacy acts who maybe charge a bit more money or a lot more money than a new act. Um, you know, people have to want to spend the 50 bucks or whatever it is that they're spending on a ticket to go see you, you know? Um, they're they're very picky, you know, they're very picky. And that's why a lot of tours get canceled because people aren't as interested in, in paying money to see someone that doesn't have, that isn't tried and true. You know, that's, that's one reason. The other reason is that people, sometimes artists spend too much damn money on stupid shit and they can't afford to go touring. You know what I mean? That's why mm -hmm. another reason why also because of the pandemic, you know, um, Things cost more, so it's more expensive to go touring. But basically, the live personal appearance has become kind of the most important thing. And the good news about that scenario is that, uh, I, I suppose, is that uh, I guess in a way to remain relevant and, and not just an oldies kind of a performer you put out new music you you have an opportunity people don't question it they don't question it. it's like hey so and so put out a record and it wasn't a hit they don't go oh it was a big failure you only you know because no one's really selling that many records anyway so it's really just seen as a sign that you're still alive that you still got some brain cells left that you still have an ability to do what you've always done Right. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a validation. Oh, they put out a record. So 
I only like their old stuff, but they're still doing it. And if I go see them perform live, they're probably going to do some of their old stuff. I'm in, right? Yeah. So that's how it is from the audience point of view. From my point of view, it means that I can, I can put out records without a lot of stress around it. There used to be so much more stress around releasing a record when I was young. When I was young, I was like, oh, are the... Ooh, are they going to get dropped by the label? Ooh, how many did they do out of the box? What? Where are they in the charts? You know, what are they saying? What's the word of the street? I don't know how many records I I had. I haven't known how many records I've sold for like literally 15 years. I have no idea. I don't have a clue how many records I sell. I did hear eventually if we do pretty good, um, uh, I'll hear from the manager. Hey, you guys done pretty good. Whatever you know, you sold you sold X. You sold way more than all these people over here. You're still in. So uh, I, we don't worry. I don't worry about that anymore. Now I can just make music, kind of not quite at my leisure, but almost at my leisure. You know what I mean? Uh, I yes, I have to go do interviews and I got to go on tour, but I always had to do that. So that's not anything different. But that's how I stay in the game uh, is to go and make new records. So that's my favorite part of it anyway. I like performing a lot. I love it. But I love recording the records even more. Mm -hmm. You know, so as long as I get to do a record every year or two, I'm, I'm, I'm great. I would do a record every six months if I could. But um, I don't push it, you know. Uh, so I, I'm happy to do do records on a regular basis. And I, and I don't feel, I've never felt compromised. I, I always do whatever the hell I want to do, but I don't feel quite the kind of annoying pressure of the record company or somebody going, Oh, can you make it a little more like this or make it a little more like that? It's like, now there's none of that concern in the air. You know, it's just sort of like, yeah, do whatever you do. When are you the, the you know, when's, <laughs> Let us know when the record's coming out so we can book your tour. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, that's what it's I, all about. I, I, I would be okay with you putting a record out every six months to begin with. <laughs> that's, that's just a greedy fan sort of thing for me to say. I, I love that you even use the words alive and brain cells as we're talking about a, a record called The Night the Zombies Came. Uh, I just wanted to kind of pluck <laughs> that out of there because that seemed just too perfect not to that you're doing that. But uh but and 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 I I want to pick up on that too because you said this is not a concept record by any means, but at the same time, you know, as you talk about for as long as you all have been making the music, as you were just referencing right there, and and what you've written about in the past, and maybe some fan expectations. I mean, even in the last few records, you know, I'm thinking of like Graveyard Hill and and Haunted House and things like that, and you got the zombies. I mean, what's keeping it? What's keeping you from doing that? From making that concept album? Uh, you've done, you've done books, which, by the way, still one of my favorite things I've ever, I've ever had. I still oh, love cracking yeah, this open. You. Uh, you know what? What is keeping you from going that extra step like that? No one asks me. Well, let me see. What is? I, I guess. Um, I love. I like the idea of a rock opera, but I don't know that anyone successfully pulled that off because basically your average pop music fan doesn't go to the opera. I've never been to the opera. Um, I think I understand what it's all about. Um, I used to take singing lessons from an opera singer, but um, I'm not an opera person, you know? But yet we have two things going on. We have the concept of the LP, the long play record, which started, I believe, in 1948 with the release of several singles and EPs compiled uh, for the artist uh, Frank Sinatra. And Columbia Records or CBS, whoever, Columbia, I guess, put out um, the first sort of pop LP. And uh, ever since then, we've had LPs. Now, streaming destroyed the concept of the LP you would or you would have thought that it would have because we don't even buy that many records anymore mm -hmm. however even people that are young that have grown up not really touching these LPs these physical 
versions of the record, there's still this kind of romantic notion around the idea of an LP. It's a it's like a picture into the artist's life mm-hmm. in the season. What was going on in that season? What was going on in your life? You know, around when you were making that album. You know, who was there? Who was playing on it? Were, you know, were you guys fighting? Were you partying? Were you going under a religious conversion? What was going on? You know. There's this whole notion of, oh, that's the song when he was going through his, div- that's the album, that's his divorce album, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's the album, that's the album where he was on smack, you know what I mean? There's all of these, we want to, human, we understand that concept of a season. And the LP really represents a season, I think. And even though people don't, buy records like that for the most part anymore they we consume them streaming uh and we listen to things in piecemeal it's still this notion of the lp i think is very much alive you can't really get rid of it for whatever the reason i don't know what the reason is but um that's the way that i see it and so uh what was my point oh oh here's my point that's part one. Part two of my point is some of us who are all of us understand the idea of a concept album or call it a rock opera, your quadrophenias, you know, whatever. Uh, that's cool. Everyone understands that concept, but it's very rare. Like you'll have some artists, oh, I'm going to do a new album, but it's all, it's called the blah, blah, blah. And it's a story and it's you know we want to like elevate the lp to like a novel or to a great cinema presentation right we really want to we want in our hearts to elevate it to that but much like the music video it doesn't quite get there we wanted to make the video its own art form right Uh, it didn't work out that way did it it just has never people still make them people have been doing them since they put out records Mm -hmm. but it's never really oh that's not the new art form oh what rock what's what's your favorite rock opera (laughs) people can't even tell you what the one rock opera is about you know what i mean they don't really know the way that we relate to rock and roll music or pop music is it's like the three minute pop songs. It's got a beginning and a middle and an end, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and end, right? That is how we consume music, but yet we still love an LP. And, and I think we still love the idea of con- unifying concepts, unifying themes, uh, the your rock opera. And, um, so what happens when I make records, uh, I've noticed with Pixies, uh, especially in recent years, is sometimes there'll be a word or a phrase or a notion that enters the room at some point. Um, in this case, it's sort of like zombie or whatever, a zombie movie or something like that. I don't remember when that first came up, but as soon as something like that comes up in a very sort of not very serious way i'll say to the producer oh, are you are you are you paying attention here there's a zombie in the room because he's sitting right over there in the chair let's not make too big a deal out of it we don't need to like talk to him we don't need to address it but that's that's what in the room now that's what's in the room and so the next time the notion comes up in the next song or whatever. It's not going to be every song. It's not going to always be a specific reference that you can go, ah, there's zombie again. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. It's real loose, but there's an idea that's, that's around. And then as soon as you acknowledge it, suddenly that idea lingers and it's around more and the more that you're open to it the more it shows up and the less you question it you know what i mean yeah um and so you know i mean whatever there's been a lot of zombie stuff in in popular culture the last 20 years just like vampires um hey you want to what's is there a metaphor going on there i don't know maybe i mean Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. 
We did have a global fucking pandemic a few years ago, so we can start there, right? <laughs> you know, I don't even need to go any further than that. It's like I don't need to explain why or maybe zombie is an appropriate metaphor for, for an LP in the year 2024. But, you know, all one has to do is to look at the history books and go, oh, well, the world has is still reeling from this global pandemic, so... There's something in the air, you know what I mean? There's some kind of thing that we're, just like when I'm making a record, everyone knows there's a zombie in the room. You know what I mean? Whatever you want that to mean, whether you want it to be literal or spiritual or emotional or political or whatever, it's there. It, 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 once it's there, you uh, why get rid of it? It's It's sort of, it's... It's 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 a psychological whip that's kind of moving you along. You know what I mean? Going, whoosh, whoosh. don't forget it, Bobby. Whoosh, I'm right here. Don't don't kick me out. You know what I mean? It's like it's it's part of it becomes part of the artistic process. You know, and so and to me, it's much more interesting or legitimate than saying. Let's have a concept album by a guy named Jimmy. And Jimmy, like, blah, 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 blah. On we go. It's exhausting, right? It's exhausting. But if I just go, yeah, there's something in the air, you know? That and that's going to inform a lot of things. And I think that is where you want i think i think that's where you want rock music to be that's where you want songs to be you want them to be open-ended somewhat mm -hmm. you don't i mean look unless you're like a prog rock band and you're doing you know if it's a marillion album about like you know some elf colony or something you know nothing against marillion or whoever i'm not dissing them i'm just saying i get it there's a there's some people that take that to the next level and that's fine. I have no problem with that. That's not what I'm doing here. I think if you look at say the songwriting of uh, say Neil Young is a good example, you know, where there's a lot of universality in his, in his lyrics and there's a lot of stuff that's not on the nose, you know what I mean? And it's kind of a little bit open-ended and it kind of allows you to interpret the music as you, just like looking at a painting. It's like, how much do we want to dictate here? And how much do we want to like leave it open so that the, the listener can kind of develop their own relationship with it, right? And that's psychologically also a lot more interesting. It's a lot more interesting... Like when I would go to a therapy, right? You you're telling the story, you're telling the therapist one story, right? And you think, oh, I know what they want to hear this week. They want to talk about blah blah blah. And I got it all up here. I'm gonna tell them all about this and blah 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 blah. You tell them the thing, and then what the, the fuck they do? They go, whoa, 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 stop. That little thing you said five minutes ago, that little funny expression or that little word, or what's that all about? And then you're like down a totally different rabbit hole. It's psychologically way more interesting, you know what I mean? So I think for me to be open-ended and to be kind of a little bit loose with the concepts and the notions is good for it's good it's good for the rock. It's good, I think. One thing I love about all that and and something I've always wondered about your writing specifically in 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 Pixies uh, like I was talking to my wife yesterday about this record. We were kind of discussing, you know, when I was researching the interview and all that stuff. <clears throat> and uh, and we were talking about the song and she brought up something about getting into the meaning of the lyrics. And I said, you know, for Pixies, for me, I love the lyrics. Most of the time, I don't know what you're talking about as you're as you're getting it, that it's almost more about mood. Like, I like the mood that you produce. You, I, It might have been in the press release with uh, Motorola, the, one of the new songs on the uh, record, where you said you're just fishing around for lyrics. doesn't matter if I know what's going on. There's a Berlin adventure happening, you know, but but that's what I love. Right. Like, when you said, you know, way back then, you're slicing up eyeballs, and I'm like, the fuck is that about? I don't care. <laughs> that's fun to say. It's fun to sing. And my God, I love the mood of this. Like, for you as the writer... How important is it for me to understand what you're talking about versus just to have this, you know, blanket envelop me uh, with, with with whatever the song is in totality? Yeah, I mean, also, at least for a band like the Pixies, 
you know, we, we have an international audience. A lot of our audience doesn't even speak English. And they're responding to the music. They like it or whatever. Um, I, I don't know. When I listen to, I'm a big fan of the Italian uh, writer, uh, songwriter, uh, Paolo Conte. And I don't speak Italian. I have no fucking idea what Paolo is on about. But I suspect just by the mood that he's created with the the music, I suspect he's probably a pretty good lyricist. You know what I mean? I can just tell. You can just tell in the choices that he's making with the words, even though I don't understand them, probably put some thought into it or some spirit or whatever it is that drives him. It's not just, you know, he didn't just fart it out or whatever. Um, it's good. And so... Uh, I had to take that into consideration. I don't have to, but I, I do now take that into consideration. The people in Paris, they don't know what the hell I'm on about. Um, but they can, if they want to, learn what that lyric's can, about. And suddenly to. there's a there's you a history could. lesson in a lot of your lyrics if you want to take that step. Sure. If you want to sit down with the song Motor Roller, uh, are you actually going to be able to figure out what the song was totally about? Probably not, but if you were to go through and pick up on all of the clues and 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 try to like go down the rabbit hole a little bit with all of the clues, you're going to start to come up. Something is going to emerge. You're going to start to have a pretty good. You're going to get warmer to what it what it is, and um, and sometimes what it is is not a very specific answer. It's it's more of a. It's kind of like. Well, look, first of all, I only got two or three minutes and I don't even have, I'm only on the mic for the verses and the choruses and I I, I got to make a rhyme. Um, I have to repeat things. I don't have to, but a lot of times you repeat things, you know, um, and uh, even though like when I'm writing a lot of music, it's like I'm looking through a keyhole into a big giant ballroom, a whole universe of stuff, you know, and I have to sh straight. I can't put everything that I see into one little song. It's it's too much. It's too much information there. I don't know. I can't decide what is the good information and what is the bad information. I can't necessarily tell you what is the most entertaining aspect of it. All I can do is say, well, I'm the shaman here, so I'm going to tell you what I see in the keyhole. Hold on. Here we go. Okay. So now when I'm writing the song, that's what I'm looking through the keyhole, right? I'm connected the dots. Cause I'm like, I'm on this, like, it's almost like a, it's like a, a adrenalized amphetamized. I'm not on an amphetamines, but it's like, it's very, very, it's what I imagine amphetamines to be like, it's very, very rapid. And I'm and I'm jumping from place to place, and my mind is like connecting a lot of dots. And I'm kind of and a lot of it might even be rationalizations. I might be like, oh, of course, I'm going, of course that, of course that is connected. Don't, oh my gosh, this is perfect. I can't believe everything's connected. This is perfect. And you go through that process and you finish the song. And then lo and behold, a week goes by, a two weeks go by. Two months go by, two years go by. The longer that time passes, the more time that passes, the less I am connected to that manic experience that I had when I wrote it. And so you ask me about songs from a long time ago, and I'm just like, I don't know. I don't remember. I sort of like, was it about, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If you ask me in the moment when I'm writing it, it's all very, very clear to me. You know what I mean? It's like I have the deciphering key that explains it all, why it all makes perfect sense. You know what I mean? And it's almost like a it's almost like a little bit of a crazy thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it's like a it's like my own conspiracy theory. You know what I mean? It's like, no, you don't understand, it's all connected, right? But uh, and maybe it is and maybe it is, I don't know, but that's what it feels like. And so I, I've only got this two or three minute song to kind of squeeze in whatever I can, you know. 
the end result is that you end up with things that are abstracted out sometimes. And those tend to be sometimes the more interesting things. Not always, you know, hey, there's plenty of great songwriters out there that that don't write like that. They're like, I need to write a song about this. Mm -hmm. And they write, they're very specific. And they, it's like they're writing a, 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 a thesis or something. And it's very clear. And you read that lyric and you go like, oh my God, it's a song about this. Very, very clear. When I do that, I would say I get, at best, I get sort of esoteric or quirky results. At worst, I get sort of mediocre, kind of boring results. You know what I mean? Um, and so I try as much as I can to get in this kind of poetic, manic kind of headspace when I'm writing music. When it gets too bogged down in the meaning and everything, nothing against people that write that way, but that's not what I'm that good at. You know what I mean? I would like to be, and sometimes, for God's sakes, I, I try – and I try to write some biographical song or a historical song or something like that. I try to make it so that it all makes sense so that when you experience my song, when you get to the end of it, you're going to totally get it and understand. I still fall for that fucking trap from time to time. I still do it. But I got to say, if I were to judge myself, I probably don't get away with it as much as I would like to, you know? So I definitely go for a looser, open-ended, more poetic kind of thing because that's where I'm comfortable and it always has the more interesting result, you know? It's always more psychological. It's always way more psychological. I remember when I did my first solo record uh, called Frank Black, um, CDs they had put out, they were putting out all these box sets of, of, of artists, you know, on CD. That was the thing remastered or bonus tracks and all that. Right. And I got a copy uh, of uh, pet sounds. Right. And I knew a lot of the songs on that record, but I never really had sat down and listened to the whole record from beginning to end. And then not only did I have the record, but I had this sort of box set version of it or whatever. This had all of this bonus stuff in it, right? And there was a song on there called uh, I Know There's an Answer, but which I didn't really know that well or, or at all. But there was this other version of the song with a different lyric called um, Hang On to Your Ego. And when I heard that, I I I went, um, oh, that's that's psychologically, that's way more interesting to say, hang on to your ego is way more interesting than I know there's an answer. You know what I mean? It's just it's just like you can't even compare. You know what I mean? Nothing wrong with I know there's an answer, but hang on to your ego is fucking what the hell that's Whoa, what's that all about? Hang it's on to you. That's like, yeah. It's just a guy, it's way, it's darker and it's more mysterious and it feels almost more true. You know, mm -hmm. it feels, it feels much more true to, to, to the human condition than something that's sort of like just a, a plaintive, hopeful statement or something. You know what I mean? I know there's an answer. You know, I mean, I get it. I know there's an answer. I, I, I could see myself writing a song like that, but hang on to your ego. It's like, it's all, it's almost haunting. You know what I mean? And so that was a good lesson for me at that point. I think it was probably my producer, Eric Feldman, who said when I went and did that version, he said, oh, that's way more interesting from a psychological point of view, way more interesting. Let's do that version as opposed to the original version. And so uh, that was a good lesson. I was like, oh, yeah, it's way more interesting, isn't it? And um, yeah, so I have I, I that was a good epiphany kind of a moment. And so I've always tried to steer things more into the psychological. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think I could pick out lyrics from. Geez, any of these songs. You're so impatient. Chicken, Primrose, I Hear You, Mary. I mean, the way you still pull those out of there. Um, and I'm only kind of breezing through there because I only have a few minutes here. But but since you brought up that, you've also got, I mean, we have this new Pixies record, but you're going to tour next year the 30th anniversary of the Teenager of the Year album, which in itself, much like a lot of those Beach Boys songs and albums that you know you've referenced there, there was a record 
that sort of came out and made its little noise at the beginning and then kind of backed up and became something else over the years. Uh, I, I'm doing the thing that you said you have trouble doing when I, you're asking you to revisit something, but what makes that record so special? I don't know how you feel about it, but what I would ask you is, why do you love this record? Well, the one thing that I think that Eric and I would, could both agree on is that we really enjoyed making it. And at the time, we were interrupted by the earthquake, uh, the, the Northridge earthquake. Uh, all our tapes got stuck in a vault because uh, they all the, the vault was an electric vault, and the LA lost all the power. We that interrupt. We were interrupted by. Um, by uh, brush fires in LA. Uh, we had to move studios because of the fires. Um, we had to move studios because uh, I, um, uh, the, the, the other co-producer and engineer, Al Clay, he had to leave. He wanted the record to be done when we were about halfway through. And he was actually kind of mad at us because we, He's like, well, this is the version of the record I believe in, right? Of course, he believed in it because he, he had to leave and go work on his next record. But Eric and I were so, like, having such a good time, and we didn't care, you know? And the record company, it wasn't like we were spending millions of dollars on it, but we were definitely spending tens of thousands of dollars on it. And it wasn't like crazy. I think we ended up spending about 200 grand on the record. But for the time, that wasn't like, that crazy right. but um you know at one point you know uh, we asked uh we asked them uh look uh the record could be done right now as planned but we would like to continue and make more make it more make it bigger and they said yes i don't know why they said yes they could have said no and it would have been over, but they said yes. And so we kept spending the money and they said, okay. And they, they, they believed in the, in the artist or they were distracted by the things. I don't know what it was, but we were able to continue working and continue having that fun and bouncing around between different studios. And I, I would just, uh, literally just show up with a new song every day and without lyrics or anything. And the guys I was playing with were what you call quick studies. Right. So I'd be like, you know, they're like way better musicians than I am, but I was writing the, the music. So I was like, Oh, here's another one. They were like, okay. <laughs> and it was so much fun to get all this kind of results so quickly, you know, and we just, uh, we had a blast making that record. And so, yeah, it's quirky and it's esoteric, but we really weren't crawling up our own ass. You know what I mean? It was not that kind of an atmosphere where it was so important and we were taking it really serious. Mm -hmm. It was more like, we could do whatever we want and no one seems to care. And this is fun. And this is what it must be like to be in the Beatles. And you know what I mean? We just like, um, yeah, so much fun. I remember we were working at, uh, I think it was um, a studio that was owned by, oh, it was owned by, what's his name there from the Eurythmics, Dave Stewart. Mm -hmm. He had this studio um, and, uh, and, and the house that was in front of the studio that uh, was just in the back, like in the carriage house or something. And the, the studio that the house in the front, he, he wasn't living there, but he would rent it out to his famous friends or whatever, who were making movies. Eric Idle was in there making a movie or something. So he would show up at the end of a day of shooting, just walk in the session drunk as a skunk. You know what I mean? Cause he just been, he'd been filming all day and he just had his Heineken's, you know, and he was just, he show up blasted at the end of the day, um, kind of right when we were kind of getting going, you know, he would show up with his guitar and he, he would want us to change a guitar string or something for him. You know, <laughs> He just wanted to hang out because he just, he just wanted to be around a recording session. And so that was really fun for us. It was like, Hey, we got Eric Idle here, you know, <laughs> you know, changing Eric's strings for him, you know, and, Oh, Jeff Flynn's out there playing tennis, the Kenneth Torts today, you know. And uh, I remember we were working in another studio with uh, uh, um, Sergio Mendez, you know, Sergio Mendez, mm -hmm. Brazil Absolutely. 66, yep. right? Mm -hmm. uh, we had just seen Sergio perform 
with Brazil 99, right, in Las Vegas, because all the power, I told you, that we, the, the record got shut down because of the earthquake. We went to Vegas for a few days. Eric and my wife and I, we all went to Vegas to take a shower because we had no, none of us had water or anything like that or toilets that worked. We we're like, let's go to fucking Vegas for a week and get out of L.A., and we can't work on the record anyway. So we would go there and we went to shows. And I remember we saw Sergio Mendez and he was great. And um, we went back to LA and we ended up working at a studio that we heard he actually owned the studio. And it was up in the hills of Calabasas, you know. And there was this huge fire raging, like about a mile down the road. And they hadn't evacuated the neighborhood yet, but we had the studio, it was all black on the inside, you know, like all uh, cloth, black cloth and black furniture. Everything was black. And we found out after a couple of days that we were exhausted because we couldn't turn on enough lights and it just kept absorbing all the, all the light. And we just were like, it's so tiring. It must be because everything is black in here. So they had all these big, huge widescreen TVs in the studio control room. So we just, put it on the, the fires that were raging down the street on the news, you know, cause they kept, you know, they kept evacuating certain neighborhoods and we were like, shit, we're going to have to evacuate here pretty soon. And, but every day we'd be like, are we good to go? And the studio manager would be like, yeah, you're still good. No evacuations yet. And the fire, just get, we eventually did have to evacuate. And then, but we, we just kept pushing it and pushing it. The fire we had, so all the TV screens were just like, blazes of flames going around and we're like doing vocals like from my Cadillac over like a CB radio and stuff and just it was just kind of kooky and fun and experimental and not at all serious right. just like just like life is crazy and it's all the world's going to California's falling into the ocean or whatever the hell's going on here but we're making a record and we're not going to stop until we're done having fun and and that's what we did and then eventually it was like it was finally we were exhausted and we were done and we, we couldn't do any more and we said okay it's done record's done and um that that's yeah we didn't yeah. know what people would think about it you know we didn't we didn't i didn't presume that i made the greatest record that ever was made i didn't presume that it was sergeant peppers you know i didn't presume that it was quadrophenia i just went whatever we made a record we had a great time and whatever man yeah what are we what, what are they gonna do sue us if you don't like it fucking sue us <laughs> we don't care and it was just the the kind of the, that was the atmosphere of making that record and uh it was awesome you know what i mean it was just like it was a blast yeah. i don't think i've had as much fun making a record since then it was uh, it was great Love the, the even the line right now. I want to live on an abstract plane. Just makes a lot more sense to me. And by the way, and I do have to jump off. But um, it's, it's talking about things in the air. Uh, yesterday, I was doing an interview with Les Claypool and, and Maynard Keenan, and uh, Les was just hanging out with Eric Idle and Weird Al and some other folks. And it's like that's twice in two days that Eric Idle has ended up in one of these. And I don't think I've talked about Eric Idle in six years before this. So uh, whatever that is, anyway. But. <laughs> um, uh, really, seriously, congrats on the new record with uh, The Night the Zombies Came. Uh, I'm looking forward to some of these solo shows as well. And uh, and my God, it has been so much fun to talk to you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks. Good to see you again. Take care. Me too. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you for uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.